So, um, hi everyone, I'm Jules. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Facebook in London, and I work on the Infer team. Uh, so Infer is not that. Sorry. Full screen? No. Definitely not. Play. Thank you. Why did it? No, that works. So Infer is a static analyzer. It's open source, so you can find it on GitHub. Um, and it ships with a number of analyses by default uh, that do a range of things, the most advanced of which is uh, a memory safety analysis that tries to flag bugs about null pointer exceptions or memory resource leaks or double free or, or the like. Um, and it also has um, simpler analysis all the way to linters that you, you, there's even a small DSL to define your own syntactic checks on, on the code, for instance. Um, and one of the defining characteristics of the m more complex analysis in Infer uh, is that they are interprocedural. So that means they are able to flag issues that involve several procedures at once, possibly in several files. So um, in the rest of the talk, I'll explain um, a bit about Infer's architecture and how it does interprocedural analysis um, and in a, at a high level. And I will also explain how we deploy it at Facebook, uh, where it does uh, diff time analysis. OK, so um, Infer starts from a project, which is some source files and a build system to, to build these files. And uh, it's architecture like a compiler. So there, first, there's a front end that takes source code in the source language, so Java or uh, languages supported by Clang. And uh, much like a compiler, it translates them into a much simpler and common to all languages, um, IR, that is called SIL. And SIL is uh, much simpler than uh, Java or C++. It's just basically loads and stores and function calls and uh, go-tos. Then once all the source files have been translated um, into Infer's language, uh, the backend analysis run, uh, and for, so for each procedure, they compute a summary of the procedure um, in isolation of all the other procedures, and they are stored as what we call specs. Uh, so there's one specification for each procedure, and this is also the point where errors are flagged. So most of the analysis work by trying to establish that the procedure has no bug, and when there's a failure in that proof, then a bunch of heuristics kick in to classify the failure of the proof either as a weakness in the analyzer or as something that looks more like a bug that we should report. And so at the end of the analysis, we collect all these uh, issues we found and we, we build a report. OK, let's zoom in into the front end, uh, how it works. So there are two front ends, one for Clang languages and one for Java. I uh, will describe them both. Um, so we start with the project, the source code, and the build system. And uh, now we need to find uh, where, the, where the code lives. So we, act, we ask the build system, actually. So the way you would run infer is just typing, for instance, infer dash dash make, and infer will do all the work of figuring out, figuring out what to do. And the way it works is it runs the build system and capture calls to the compiler that happen during compilation. And so it records for each source file the way to, it records, that allows it to discover which source files should be analyzed and how they are compiled. And so it's a bit of a, it's not the most robust part of Infer because you have to do this work for each build system. Uh, all the build systems are different and there's no sort of unified way to extract the information of how to build files um, given the build system. So that's a bit annoying uh, if you have uh, if you know solutions to this problem, uh, please talk to me. Um, so, um, but we, we have uh, integrations for a few build systems, and um, that works. So if it's a Java file, then we call Java C to get Java bytecode. And then our Java frontend actually starts from the bytecode and not the Java source, and translates Java bytecode into uh, SIL. And if it's Clang, then we run Clang 
uh, to compile the file, and we attach our own Clang plugin that dumps the Clang AST um, in some serialized format that our front end is able to read from OCaml and uh, translate also into CL. Um, so, um, and there's also the place where we plug our Clang linters. So because here we see the AST, we can run this um, source code, uh, very syntactic analysis that just l matches nodes in the AST and makes some reports. Um, and um, so we are able to do that for Clang, but not for Java, because Java, we start at the bytecode level. So uh, there's no linters for Java in uh, infer at the moment. So that was the front end. Uh, let's look at um, the back end now. Uh, so uh, the back end takes procedures that were translated by the front end, and it uh, tries to find specifications for them. So there are many analyses in Infer, as I said. Uh, they're all based on the same architecture that is compositional and on demand. So it's compositional. That means that it will schedule the analysis to look at each procedure in isolation without looking at the calling context of each procedure or, or the arguments with which a procedure is called. So the analysis, each analysis has to be uh, smart enough to be able to work on a procedure without knowing anything about where it's called. And in exchange, that allows us to uh, reuse the summary computed for the procedure in all the calling contexts. So that allows uh, infer to scale very nicely. And the architecture is also on demand. Uh, what I mean by that is that each procedure is only analyzed if it's needed for uh, the analysis, and it's analyzed when it's needed. So let's look at an example. Um, I'm going to use the allocate memory checker that we have as an example. So that's a checker that reports whenever a function is allocated with no allocation like goo here, uh, but uh, it calls a function that eventually allocates memory. So let's see how this works. So let's say we're only interested in analyzing the functions in uh, foo.java. So we start with uh, one of them, like foo, and uh, we see that it calls bar. So we need to compute the summary for bar first, so we go do that. Notice that bar here is another file. <coughs> Also, I've written this as more or less Java code, but it's actually in uh, the intermediate language of Infer. So Infer analysis bar, and it noticed that it allocates memory on line three. So that's the summary it computes. It uh, remembers that the only thing it will remember about bar now is that on line three, it allocates memory. So we come back to foo. And now we know that foo also allocates memory because and we record the reason why we think it, it allocates memory, and that's because it calls bar on line three. The reason we, re we, we recall the reason why uh, there's a bug is because when we're going to report later, it's going to be very important that we give some idea of why there's a bug to the user. So then we look at goo, it calls foo. Um, and so we go look at foo and see that its specification says it allocates, so goo also allocates. And because uh, goo is marked no allocation, uh, we report here. So note also that in goo, we only re, uh, recall that it calls foo, and we don't follow all the chain of explanation. Uh, this will be reconstructed only when needed when we report, uh, so that it scales more. OK, so that's uh, on-demand analysis, uh, uh, but interprocedural uh, issues. And so one thing we were wondering at some point is how important is it that the analysis is, is interprocedural? Sorry. And uh, so we did this case study of bugs were, that were reported by Infer recently. And we counted for each of them if they were interprocedural. So we sorted them in three buckets. One is um, bugs that you can find just by looking at one procedure in one file. The second bucket is uh, bugs you can find by looking at all the procedures, in, but only in one file. And the third category is uh, bugs that involve multiple procedures that span multiple files. 
And what we found is that for some bug types, the majority of the bugs were in the last uh, category. So, um, so it's very important. Uh, so being interprocedural and interfile gives uh, the best signal to developers. Um, so this is allocates memory that we saw, and this one is a bit particular because almost all the bugs it reports span multiple files. And uh, all the way at the bottom, there's a byte pointer comparison, which is a linter, and so a linter only looks at uh, the AST of one file. So unsurprisingly, it only reports uh, intra-procedural bugs. Um, I think I wanted to say no. Okay, so. How do we deploy infer at Facebook? So uh, I said it's, uh, it reports at diff time. So when a, whenever a developer sends a new change, it will uh, go through our CI system. And our CI system runs a bunch of tests. And it also schedules an analysis via infer. And this, is, this happens all at the same time as human reviewers are reading the code and making comments. And so infer is commenting on the div just as other human reviewers will. So if it finds the bugs, it reports it uh, on Fabricator, which is our code review tool that's also open source. And uh, infer comments look just like other human reviewer comments. So in that case, that's a report, that's a report generated by infer that says that there might be an older reference in, uh, caused by the div. And one important point is that uh, in this integration, infer, we only surface the bugs that infer finds that were introduced by the diff, and only if they were in files that were touched by the diff. And the reason we, we do that is that uh, that's what the developer currently has context on and is working on this change, and so is able to uh, act on, on these warnings much more than on warnings about unrelated things. So at some point, um, infer is happy with the diff, and all the code reviewers are happy about the diff. And so then uh, it makes it into the code base and into our products. Um, so let's go back to our example and see how diff analysis works a bit more in details. So let's say that our diff was the diff that introduced the call to foo in the no allocation method. So that's the, the state of the code after the diff. Uh, that's what we saw earlier. Uh, so we know that infer does this on uh, that version of the code. Uh, that it reports the error on goo because it calls foo that allocates. So then what infer will do is it will analyze the base commit, the version of the code without the diff. So in this version, goo doesn't call foo. And also, we need to reanalyze foo.java because that's the file that was modified. <coughs> So infer analyzes foo again. Uh, it needs bar. It already has a spec for bar. And this one doesn't need to change because we know that bar hasn't changed. And so it will computer get that foo allocates via bar. And then when it analyzes foo, goo, it says that it does nothing. It, there's no allocation there. So now that it did these two analyses of the base and the diff, uh, it knows that on the base there was no report. On the diff, there was this uh, one report about foo. And so what it will report to the user is what was reported on the diff minus what would be reported on the base. So uh, it will report the new error. So this diff base deployment model uh, has been quite successful so far. Uh, we find that it helps developers move fast um, and give them more confidence about their code changes, because infer will check that they don't introduce too many bugs. It also makes life easy for us, because it makes it very much easier to um, deploy new checks, uh, because we only report new bugs introduced by diffs. So even if a new analysis that we ship has a legacy of thousands of bugs in the code base. We don't need to care about this right now because developers will not see them because they were already there. They will only see the new ones that they introduce. So we, we find that quite valuable. Uh, for instance, um, the another situation uh, 
that's not like this is compiler warnings. I find they're always a pain to enable on projects because there are always so many pre-existing warnings and you can never turn the, the warning you want into an error straight away because you have to fix all the pre-existing ones first. So, so this, the, this kind of deployment avoids that issue. Okay, so that's more or less it. The current status is um, um, infer runs on all diffs for Android uh, and our iOS apps as well as our, our C++ backend. And that represents um, tens of thousands of diffs uh, every month. And um, there are thousands of issues fixed every month um, out of all the ones reported by Infer. And, uh, and um, that's about a 70% fix rate. And um, the fix rate is what we measure uh, as giving good signal to developers. Uh, <coughs> is um, It's the proportion of reports the, that were fixed by developers uh, as they were reported by Infer. And uh, that's, uh, that's the metric we take and not some other metrics like false positives or uh, things like this because that's a metric we can actually measure. Um, so that's why it's important to us. Okay, that's all I had to say. Uh, thanks for listening. Any questions? Yes. So back in the example with the memory allocation, what if the allocation happens conditionally depending on one of the parameters of the functions? Is the system smart enough to right, analyze so the, the whole site? The question is what if the allocation happens conditionally uh, depending on um, the parameters passed to the function? I think for this checker, uh, this checker is quite simple. And I don't think it looks at this kind of thing. I think it would report anyway, but I'm not quite sure. But some other, some other checkers we have, like the ones for m uh, memory safety, they try very hard to follow the, so the values as well. They do uh, kind of uh, start over again, to uh, track uh, which parameters will, will cause certain effects. And then so one way to I don't know if this checker does this already, but uh, the way I, uh, we would uh, do that would be to record two, two specifications for that function. One where um, some parameter, if uh, x equals zero as the precondition, then it doesn't allocate, and another of if it's not, then it allocates. And then at the call site, you can see in which, in which uh, branch you are. Uh, yes, I believe you were. So I have a quick question of div-based deployment. Help me understand if it's part of open source code base or is it something internal? That uh, the question is, uh, is the diff-based deployment uh, part of the open source code base or not? Uh, so at the moment, it mostly lives in our CI code uh, and not in infer. Uh, there's ongoing work about moving that logic inside infer itself. So no, for now, there is part um, there is part of it in Infer already, which is the part about comparing two reports and computing the lists of uh, pre-existing and fixed and introduced uh, buckets. Yes? This is a follow-up. Uh, how, how is it linked in the two parts, the ana static analysis and the isolation of uh, Errors regarding the, the diff. How much are they linked in infer? And how mm. is it? Is, do you envision that it would be possible to reuse the diff analysis part for other static analysis tools so in the, a CI context? The question is how uh, how interwoven are the static analysis part and the diff analysis part and. At the moment, not at all. Uh, we just run in for once, run in for a second time, and then we do some logic just on the JSON report. Um, so that's how it works. So it, it, can, it works the same way for all our analysis because it just works on the final report. So it could be a separate project? Uh, yeah, it could be a separate project that works for other things as well. Uh, yes? So you said that uh, <laughs> uh, when there is a warning, you don't warn if the warning is not in the diff itself. That sounds like a very bad idea, right? Because <laughs> I have a library function and I wrote, I break it, then the rest of the code is closed, and the, 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 the diff, so I will not 
Yeah, so the question is um, that uh, we report only on the files touched in the dev, and isn't that a terrible idea, for instance, for libraries, because you're breaking all the clients and you don't know it? Yes, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> So do we have? Do we sometimes look at this? Uh, so um, uh, no, not at the moment. Uh, we don't quite know how to su how we would surface these issues to developers or how it will uh, run. So um, yeah. So uh, we're still figuring this out. Uh, we're trying to surface all the bugs to developers. For instance, all the pre-existing bugs in the code base. That's one way to do it, but that doesn't quite answer this question. Uh, yes. Uh, last question. Last question. Okay. Uh, which uh, one other um, source analysis, uh, source code analysis tool do you use at Facebook? Uh, which other static analysis tools do we use at Facebook? Uh, I think we use a range of static analysis tools, but uh, I'm not sure exactly which at what on what part of the project. Um, use Clang. We use Clang. Yeah, we use Clang Analyzer as well on some parts of the code. Um, and yeah, we use a bunch of, of, of static analyzers. I'm not quite sure which, sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. I think that's it.